Ambition is the path to success. Persistence is the vehicle you arrive in. The year is 1998 and a driven developer at Squaresoft finds himself frustrated. His name is Tetsuya Takahashi and he, along with his wife Kaori Tanaka as a partnered writer, has just acted as director for the newly completed Xenogears, a title that was originally brought forward as a proposal for Final Fantasy VII. Deemed too dark in its premise but still intrigued by the idea, Takahashi was allowed to develop it as its own separate title. Upon its release, Xenogears would go on to receive critical acclaim for its soundtrack, gameplay and most notable narrative, touching on deep and thought-provoking themes but also delivering on them in equal measure. Such praise would elevate Xenogears to legacy-defining in many respects, and it's still recognised as one of the most influential JRPGs of all time. However, this praise was not enough for Takahashi, as the finished product did not fit the vision he originally had for the title. Squaresoft's two-year development cycles worked at odds with the scale of the game, meaning that ideas had to be cut, as not only was Xenogears an ambitious project already in terms of scope, but the development team was also in experienced. Unable to deliver on the closing deadline, Takahashi would propose a workaround to prevent the narrative cutting off abruptly, resulting in its now infamous Disc 2. To Takahashi, this was the lesser of two evils, as it at least allowed the team to complete the scenario that was originally planned. However, the inability to see the game through to its true form, so to speak, would eat away at him. As the months passed, this sense of alienation would continue to build as Takahashi grew increasingly frustrated with the business practices of Square and its seeming prioritisation of its flagship Final Fantasy. This effectively hamstrung the developer, who was unable to work on his own projects, most notably a potential sequel to Xenogears itself. This eventually culminated in him, along with two other alumni who had worked with him on Xenogears in Hirohide Sugiura and Yasuyuki Hon, to found Monolith Soft in 1999, a now well-known name in the JRPG sphere, but at this point in time, unproven to many. Monolith Soft was created with the express purpose of giving full creative freedom to the developers so that they could focus on the project that they held passion for. And though many large publishers wouldn't provide support on the business side of the spectrum, citing Monolith Soft as too risky, Masaya Nakamura, founder of Namco, shared in the ideals and beliefs of Takahashi and Sugiura, the two main proponents of Monolith Soft before Hon's eventual involvement. With the blessing of Nakamura behind them, the now liberated developers were free to work, and for Takahashi, his first point of interest was to create what he couldn't realised back at Squaresoft. Planning out the spiritual successor to Xenogears once again with Kaori Tanaka by his side, the eventual result was Xena Saga, and true to its name, the original plan was to have a saga of six games. It would also act as a reboot of sorts for Takahashi, allowing him to realise the themes and ideas he originally intended for Xenogears. In a desire to deliver on a truly compelling narrative, the first game alone, Xena Saga Episode 1, boasted over eight hours of FMV cutscenes, which were also lauded for their relatively high quality at the time. And though it it too started strong in terms of commercial reception, its sequel in Episode 2 could only reach 50% of Namco's projection, with the final mainline title in Xenosaga Episode 3, while seen as a satisfactory conclusion despite being cut in half from the original plan, performed the worst of all, which was a shame as it was clear Monolith Soft were gradually incorporating improvements from game to game. However, it was clear that not only was the team too inexperienced once again, but the project itself far exceeded the budget that was available. Takahashi himself admitted that, We released three games in the Xenosaga series, but they weren't very well received. I felt that because no one on the team making Xenosaga had any experience, it might be a little bit too difficult for us to make our ideal game. It was clear that Takahashi's ambition had once again outstripped what was feasible at that point in time. The resultant, disappointing commercial reception of Xenosaga's final hurrah was a hard pill to swallow for the young development team, who felt that the past four years of work were all for naught, severely impacting the team's morale. This, however, was not the only issue. By 2002, initial supporter of Monolith Soft Nakamura had retired as the head of Namco, and this was eventually followed by a merger with Bandai in 2005. The resultant entity, now known as Bandai Namco, were increasingly less willing to take commercial risks, and this creative stranglehold was all too familiar to the founders of Monolith Soft, as they were now experiencing the same thing they wished to get away from when they left Square a limit on their creative freedom. However, as the relationship soured, an executive director from Nintendo, Shinji Hatano, came in with a proposition. In an interview from 2017, Sugiyori was quoted as saying, that's when we received consultation from Nintendo's then-managing director Shinji Hatano. Hatano-san told us, Just go out there and make something that can't be found elsewhere in the industry, something original with an independent spirit. That was just the thing Monolith Soft looked to accomplish, and that's when it was decided that we would become a 
subsidiary of Nintendo. In exchange for creating exclusive works on Nintendo hardware, Monolith Soft once again had the creative freedom they yearned for. This also came at just the right time, as Takahashi had been working on the early stages of a brand new project, a world surrounded entirely by water that served as an arena for two colossal titans. This would later be constructed by himself and Han to better visualise the concept. After sharing the idea with senior members and bringing the draft to Nintendo producer Hitoshi Yamagami, development began in 2007. And even though the team once again experienced trouble in terms of the intended scale, with Takahashi laying out plans to circumvent them for a commercial deadline, Yamagami acquiesced, stating that he would get them all the time they needed to allow the game to match his vision. Whereas in the past, Takahashi was forced to compromise on his ultimate goal due to varying constraints, in this case he was given all the support he needed, a vote of confidence felt not only by himself, but the now more experienced team of Monolith Soft. Developments continued, and come two years later, it was finally revealed to the public at E3 2009. It was the surprise that caught the eye of JRPG fans everywhere. Originally announced as Monado the beginning of the world, it was later changed to be an extension of the Xeno series, as then Nintendo president Satoru Iwata wished to honour its main influence in Takahashi, recognising the work and dedication he had to see the game through to the end. The fact that it had Xeno in the name likely also captivated fans of his previous works, even though Takahashi himself made it clear in early interviews with Famitsu that it was to be an entirely new concept with new characters and a more tailored approach. Approach. Realising that the style adopted for the likes of Xena Saga was simply too old-fashioned and niche to prevail anymore, the now renamed Xenoblade Chronicles, simply called Xenoblade in Japan, would focus more on the gameplay elements while still having a degree of care added to its narrative as well. The game would eventually release in 2010 for Japanese audiences, and the European markets also had a confirmed release date of summer 2011. And this impending European release meant that many American JRPG hopefuls went to E3 2011 expecting to see it mentioned during the event. However, it was notably absent. Any hope of this simply being a fluke or an oversight were quickly snuffed out, as Nintendo's marketing manager of France, Mathieu Minel, made it clear that even though Nintendo of Europe wished to share the game at the event, it was halted by Nintendo of America, who in their words didn't want to showcase a game that they weren't going to sell. In a strange twist of fate, whereas Europe in the past had missed out on classic titles like Chrono Cross and the first Valkyrie profile, with North America being more fortunate, the roles had seemingly reversed. It appeared that Nintendo of America simply had no faith in what they saw as a niche game, and felt it wouldn't generate the returns it required to make the effort worthwhile. Despite this stance though, JRPG fans weren't going to give up, and shortly afterwards in response they created a fan-led movement to change Nintendo of America's mind. Called Operation Rainfall, or Op Rainfall for short, the name was birthed from the movement's desire to absolutely flood Nintendo of America with requests, and free games would champion the movement. The aforementioned Xenoblade Chronicles would be one such title, followed by Hironobu Sakaguchi's much-documented return to video game directing with The Last Story. The final of the three, Pandora's Tower was chosen simply because it looked cool. However, these games chosen did have substance for commercial purposes, as they had all already received an English translation for the European markets, as well as performing well critically as noted in Famitsu reviews. The organisers of Operation Rainfall chose games that they felt had the potential to generate the returns, as they were aware that passion was not the driving force of corporate decision making. It all came down to financial returns, and as a result they skewed more divisive titles like Earthseeker that had performed poorly in Japan. Giving themselves until the release of the Wii U on November 2012, or 18 months, methods by which the campaign would draw attention would come mostly in the way of emails and letters, the latter often being sent with paraphernalia linked to one of the games. Arguably their most impactful move came in regards to a pre-order window that had been left open for Monado the beginning of the world on Amazon, with fans showing their support by pushing the title to the top of the pre-order charts for one day. This last method in particular may have been referenced by then Nintendo of America President Reggie fils in an interview with Silicon Era in 2013 where he said in reference to Operation Rainfall, I'm paid to make sure that we're driving the business forward, so we're aware of what's happening but in the end we've got to do what's best for the company. The thing we know about petitions is that 100,000 signatures doesn't mean 100,000 sales. This move in particular was a clear demonstration of the pull that Xenoblade Chronicles had, an illustration that the game could indeed get the returns that Nintendo of America looked for in more intensive projects. 
In the end, whether the fan-led campaign met its original goal or not, American JRPG fans finally got their wish in late 2011, as it was announced that Xenoblade Chronicles would come to the region on the 6th of April 2012. Since that fateful day, Xenoblade Chronicles has spawned a 3DS port in 2015, followed by a definitive enhanced remaster in 2020 for the Nintendo Switch. But the question to ask here is, was the game's ever-winding journey to find itself to the majority of Western audiences worth the stress and effort? Well, it can be said that one of its defining features came about because of the trouble it had. A happy accident, if you will. Because Nintendo of America had no desire to localise the game, they also had no motive to provide voiceovers, and thus the task was left to Nintendo of Europe, who often focused on local talent. What resulted was Xenoblade Chronicles' signature English voice acting. There are all kinds of monsters. Yeah, but thanks to you, we got its shell. Everyone in the colony is going to be really happy. I'm more worried about you than the shell. Oh, whatever. Knowing what you're like, at least you'll make a decent weapon out of it. This feature in of itself was a fresh take for many, and it was received so positively by fans that it likely became the basis for the mainline sequels to go down the same route. But Xenoblade Chronicles does not use its voiceovers as a simple gimmick, with the actors delivering the more impactful lines with plenty of inflection and emotion. It also helps that the dialogue presented is of a high calibre, fitting into the main theme of the journey. The scenes as a result have a greater degree of nuance and depth, which is reflected in the characters themselves, meaning that even those who were first seen as a mascot character, notorious for just being annoying to some players actually had the cliché effect of subverting expectation and becoming beloved individuals in their own right. Xenoblade Chronicles presents a mature story, but it handles the themes associated with such an adventure with respect, demonstrated partly by the interactions between characters. Dunban and Ricky, for example, have some poignant moments between them in both the main story and optional Heart to Hearts, with both taking on a fatherly role. It allows both of them to interact in ways that feel believable, which also means that their growth is well handled and relatable to the player who witnesses it. The Heart to Hearts in particular, though short, act as reinforces to the characteristics we're already aware of, which in themselves are presented by common tropes we often see in JRPGs. However, the word trope should never be treated as a negative. Tropes are often required as they become the window by which we can relate to a character. To have something truly unique would only serve to alienate a player base, as no one would be able to empathise with said character's situation. Understanding between the player and character forms the basis of the connection that paves the journey. And ultimately, what defines the great characters in this game is how their tropes are utilised. It's through their dialogue, development and actions where we eventually decide if a character is good or not. In other words, it comes down to how well executed their character arc is, drawing on the trope itself that gives them the bones of their character, a skeleton of basic characteristics if you will, and then filling in that skeleton with the meat which can be attributed to the aforementioned elements like dialogue and development. Xenoblade Chronicles demonstrates that aspect continually. The narrative and characters fuse into a beautifully crafted narrative that is memorable for all the right reasons. That being said, it's not just the characters that prop this story up, as they work in harmony with one of the visions of Takahashi himself, that being storytelling through scale. Takahashi made it clear that he wished to deliver a grand experience to players, and he would do this most notably through the size of the world. Describing it as like an MMO in size and equal in girth to the Japanese archipelago, this was one decision that showed Takahashi and Monolith Soft had moved away from the more cinematic experience of Xenosaga, instead adopting a design philosophy that rewarded exploration, thus capturing the feeling of adventure. And sure enough, Xenoblade Chronicles deliver on this premise as Takahashi envisioned, with wide open plains and snowy Tundras blanketing the Titan of the Bionis, littered with quests, trinkets, and secret areas aplenty. One can only think how this particular facet would have turned out if Yamagami hadn't curried more time and favour for Monolith Soft during the title's development. The journey on the Bionis itself, though, lends to the storytelling on offer. Very early on, Shulk and Ryan resolve to make their way to the top of the Bionis, with other characters joining them along the way. This grand undertaking acts as a main driver to the great pacing in Xenoblade Chronicles. The imposing Makonis is seen in the distance on many occasions as the party make their way up the Bionis, and it acts as a marker of progress at various points. The goal of the journey in many cases is seen in front of you, it's visible, and acts as a constant reminder of what this adventure is all about. If I were to draw a comparison, it would be akin to the moon in Majora's Mask, adding positively to the atmosphere that the game is presenting. 
That being said, exploration is not the only defining feature of this game. If anything, Takahashi's desire to present a world similar in scope to an MMO can also be attributed to the combat. With seamless transition which he felt would aid in the game's overall flow, Xenoblade Chronicles sports a maximum of three characters engaging in combat, with the player taking control of one. Said characters will use auto attacks but also have a lineup of art that they can customise and use however they see fit, each with a global cooldown. These arts themselves will sometimes have directional importance as well to up their effectiveness, but can also be improved as the characters level up. Despite this clear similarity to an MMO, Takahashi felt it was the best way to focus on the main draw of Xenoblade Chronicles combat, that being the Monado itself. This feature would set it apart from the MMO archetype. As said by himself in 2012 in reference to the combat, I can't really explain very well how I came up with that idea. I thought that it would be more interesting to incorporate the ability to see the future into the game using a real-time battle system. I did experiment with a turn-based system that included the ability to see the future, but it didn't go very well. Either way, this power was a fitting inclusion to the game, once again encapsulating the key themes that form the cornerstone of the game's overall message. It was clear that Takahashi wanted all elements from the game's design to feed into this one grand vision he had, and the music was no exception. With its original score composed by Manami Kyoto, the music team was led by Yoko Shimamura, who was known for her role in the likes of Kingdom Hearts. At Nobuo Uematsu's recommendation, who was also involved with his label Dog Ear Records, Ace Plus were also brought on board. Split into various teams, Ace Plus would handle battle tracks while Kyoto would handle the environmental score. The work of the team experienced a fair amount of hardship, mostly due to Takahashi rejecting many of the songs that he felt were too literal in terms of the plans he had initially given them. That being said, the the direction and harmony of the team was profound and resulted in a score of around 90 tracks when all was said and done. Despite this milestone though and the ever nearing completion of the game, there was still one more song that had to be composed, one that Takahashi saw as a song that would bring the vision and theme of the game full circle. Realising its importance, he called upon Yasunori Mitsuda, a man who had worked with him on the scores of Xenogears and Xenosaga Episode 1. Mitsuda was well aware of the task he had to accomplish, he felt that music was the portal by which emotion could most easily pass to the player, and that vision was encompassed fully by this final song. As said in an interview with Nintendo in relation to Takahashi's praise of his work, he was quoted as saying, well, it makes me happy, of course. It's that simple. I think at heart, games are something that you enjoy via a combination of your eyes, ears, and the feel of the controller in your hands. I always try to be aware of the importance of taking the music and making that element fit in with the images and story, enhancing the player's emotional response. Though it caused a large amount of stress to the man himself, Mitsuda finally returned to Takahashi with the composition for Beyond the Sky, which incorporated everything he felt the game was building up to after reading the script fully. Needless to say, it received unanimous praise, and was a testament to the overall quality of the music and sound design that made up Xenoblade Chronicles. The final game upon its release, like the musical score, also received a wide collection of plaudits, with many sites affording it perfect scores for its unique approach despite taking on a simple and well-known premise. The one issue that some pointed to were its graphics, with a fair number of reviewers feeling it lacked polish in terms of character models as compared to contemporaries, yet still drawing acclaim for its beautiful environments despite the limitations of the Wii. Even with this seeming shortcoming, it's no surprise that Xenoblade Chronicles would go on to become a commercial success despite its exclusivity, taking a spot as one of the most frequently sold titles during its initial release weeks. It would even see the West eclipsing Japan in sales as stated by Nintendo President Iwata just before the 3DS port's release. With the market clearly there, it was inevitable that the game would get its aforementioned enhanced remaster to address its minor issues in 2020, addressing several quality of life improvements to the user interface along with a notable graphic overhaul. However, the game also added exclusive content in Future Connected, an epilogue of sorts that 
wrapped up some of the loose ends from the first game. Taking place in a new zone with some added characters, Future Connected takes place one year after the events of the main story. And though not as in-depth as the main offering due to some mechanics like gift giving and skill trees being removed, Future Connected was largely well received. It adds a shorter yet fresh experience to those who enjoyed the first journey, while also acting as a minor link to the already released second mainline title, which was announced as part of the Nintendo Switch's showcase in January 2017. Aptly named Xenoblade Chronicles 2, it wasn't the title that immediately followed the development of the first game. In fact, there was a Wii U exclusive released in 2015 called Xenoblade Chronicles X, which focused more on a science fiction element in terms of a setting. This was noted as purely a spin-off, with no relation to the first game, but the world design of this would feed into Xenoblade Chronicles 2, as said by Takahashi himself in 2017. The ease or speed of developing Xenoblade Chronicles 2 stems a lot from our already having created this architecture with Xenoblade Chronicles X. The game portion of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is kind of overlaid on top of that fundamental architecture. I think that made the biggest contribution to why development went so fast. And in terms of Switch versus Wii U, another point is that we've only had to deal with one screen, so that also has made development a little bit easier. However, Xenoblade Chronicles X also had a shift in design that divided fans. In a seeming effort to move even further away from its narrative roots, X utilised a structure that eschewed a traditional story and instead made the title flow more through its missions, which fed into the exploration that Takahashi wished this game to focus on. However, the reception to this decision was lukewarm, and in an effort to appease fans, Monolith Soft began work on Xenoblade Chronicles 2, choosing to name it as such due to its similarity in design to the first game. The title would release on December the 1st, 2017, and follows the journey of Rex, an orphan salvager who roams the vast Cloud Sea to find salvage that he sells to the Argentum Trade Guild to not only look after himself, but send back to his home village. Eventually, he is given a lucrative contract to unearth an ancient ship at the bottom of the sea. The events that follow see him become the driver of the legendary Aegis. True to their word, Monolith Soft made narrative the centerpiece of Xenoblade Chronicles 2, with mature themes for the most part forming the basis of the story once again. Though more slapstick in nature in parts, the main message of the journey is clear and is handled well as the title progresses. Characters themselves are once again strong, with Rex being one of my personal shining lights in the game. His growth is relatable and well handled from start to finish, illustrating one of the best arcs I've witnessed for a character archetype that we've seen many times before. Rex is not alone in this facet, as many of the main characters also share in his praise, with good dialogue throughout and decent overall pacing. Heart to Hearts are back from the original and are a nice addition as before to dig a little deeper into to the characters in more miscellaneous settings that aren't conducive to the main story. British, Scottish and Welsh accents return as a homage to the previous title, and though some line deliveries are a bit off the mark this time around, especially in the more impactful scenes, it does progressively get better as the story approaches the ending moments. And with its story once again the focal point, Monolith Soft also had another objective for the game, to make the characters more far-reaching in terms of their expression. To do this, they entrusted the task to Masatsugu Saito, with Takahashi reiterating his support for the artist despite his inexperience at the time. We felt that in Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and X, the facial expressions were a little bit hard, a little bit stiff. We really wanted to put a little bit more focus on creating facial expressions and for the characters to be more expressive. And so, that's why we went with the direction we did, which I guess you could say is a little bit leaning towards something like Japanese animation. This is well illustrated in the cutscenes in particular, with notably clear facial expressions conveying a wide array of emotions. The animation style also appears to make Xenoblade Chronicles 2 more smooth in its cutscene direction, especially in fight sequences. The added options afforded to Monolith Soft following this change appear to have justified the shift. However, scale can so often act as a double-edged sword, and in Xenoblade Chronicles 2's case, that is reflected in its inconsistent artistic direction. With influence drawn from X for its overworld design and a desire for a more anime approach, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 also had to contend with the challenge of having a wide array of characters. As Monolith Soft at the time didn't have an in-house character designer, they once again had to source the task externally, with notable involvement from the likes of Square Enix's Tetsuya Nomura, who was responsible for the main antagonists. With other artists also involved, like Xena series veterans Kunihiko Tanaka and Soraya Saga, who worked on Blade designs, it's no wonder that the artistic flow is a bit archaic in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, but nonetheless, it fulfills the purpose it sets out to do. 
The same could be said of the music, with Yasunoi Mitsuda once again returning, but this time to act as something more akin to a project lead. Ace would handle the field music as before, while Kenji Hiramatsu, who previously worked on Xenoblade Chronicles 1, would tackle the battle music. Mitsuda considered Xenoblade Chronicles 2 to be the largest project he had ever worked on, with over 20,000 sheets of music and roughly a terabyte of compositions confined to his music producing software Pro Tools alone. As a reference, the largest that Mitsuda had worked on before this point clocked in at around 500 gigabytes. The undertaking would see the involvement of over 300 musicians, culminating in around 120 tracks at completion. Mitsuda would contribute 25 tracks to this final score, including the ending song once again. With such a heavy amount of time and work put into the collection, it's once again no surprise that the quality shines through in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, as it does the original. Whether it be sprawling fields or more involved narrative moments, the OST hits home in many cases, matching the ambience and tone of whatever is on screen at that point in time. It isn't just the musical score that replicates the first game either, as World Traversal takes on the same archetype, becoming as grand as it was the first time around. Rather than being confined to the Bionis and Meconis though, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 setting diverts to a multitude of titans that traverse the Cloud Sea, each housing diverse populations. And even though the scale of the world themselves may not be as large as from Xenoblade Chronicles 1, they do reflect the sense of grandeur that Takahashi envisioned with vibrant vistas and diverse settings aplenty. That being said, for me personally, the world design feels stronger overall. It was common in the first game to traverse a lot of land with very little in between, which admittedly fit the theme, but sometimes could be a detriment to the overall experience, especially when moving between locations or chasing 100% completion. Xenoblade Chronicles 2, on the other hand, maintains a large scale, but the maps themselves feel more cohesive in design, with multiple levels and more life packed within them. Naturally though, there's still plenty to find within the worlds themselves, and an added element of exploration is given this time around with the field skills specific to the blades. The blades in themselves are the first show of evidence that Xenoblade Chronicles 2 wasn't going to retread the same ground as its predecessor, rather it would define itself with its own unique elements, and blades are one of the fruits of that decision. Drivers are able to awaken core crystals that they find in the world to add to their blade arsenal, each with their own characteristics specific to both world exploration and battle. These skills are defined by an affinity chart that is split into nodes, and various actions done by the player can unlock these nodes. For example, killing a certain number of a specific enemy, or talking to particular a number of times. Blades are also split based upon their rarity, and the five crown blades in themselves have unique models that are easily identified. This adds a degree of RNG to the game that, for a completionist, could be a point of contention, especially when considering there are around 40 of them to find. The special blades will also often have specific quest lines that dig deeper into their character. The bonds between driver and blade are a cornerstone of the storytelling in XC2, and these side quests feel like a meaningful addition to reflect that. In many cases, they are also quite rewarding rewarding, giving a sentient quality to each blade. Whether they be searching for rare ore or trying to overcome their fear of performing, these are well worth the effort to complete. Naturally as well, the more of the quest lines you complete, the more options that will become available to the player through progression in the affinity chart. For example, a locked door may require the skill of level 4 super strength to open. If there are blades in the active party that have the skill, all those will be added together to fulfil the requirement. And it means that even when you've explored an area for the first time, there's a good chance that there will still be plenty to revisit at a later point. That being said, because of the sheer amount of blades, management of them does become a bit arduous at times, and I personally wish there was a tracker of sorts as your active blades progress to prevent going back to the affinity chart consistently. However, they are a great addition overall, and allow Xenoblade Chronicles 2 to stand apart in the series, not only in their interaction with the world, but also in their contributions to combat. And it's at this point where Xenoblade Chronicles 2 really comes into its own. The combat system borrows aspects from the first game, such as the auto attacks and use of arts, but is far deeper in design. This is one of the more complex systems on offer from any JRPG, giving plenty of options to a player to customise and choose how they want to fight. It's because of this battle system in particular that the game in some cases was criticised by reviewers, for not only being intimidating to use, but also having inadequate tutorial explanations, so much so that it bordered on player hostile and I have to agree on the tutorial aspect primarily. For the amount of new mechanics given to you, not to mention how intrinsically linked they are, it's baffling that the game doesn't allow you to revisit them. The other criticism comes in the pacing. Chapter 4 was where the combat really started to come into its own, but before that it was a struggle on my own playthrough. I see the combat in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 as something akin to an assembly line. Every process within said line contributes to the final product, in this case being the player's enjoyment. If one aspect of this line is faulty on 
missing, then the finished article ends up flawed in some way, and this is exactly the case with XC2 up until that aforementioned Chapter 4. The game has a lot to it, but takes a while to bring it all to the front. As for its meat and bones though, every driver is able to engage a maximum of three blades, and each blade will have their own weapon specific to them. Every weapon comes with a set of driver arts that are mapped to the X, Y, and B buttons, which can also be leveled up. These driver arts once again have the global cooldown seen in the original Xenoblade Chronicles, but activating them just after an auto attack hits will speed up the downtime. The final A button is the map for the blade arts, which are split into four tiers. Then you have the combos. Driver arts in some cases will have effects, like break, and the main aim to inflict damage is to follow the sequence to create a driver combo. Break moves into topple, which moves into launch, which moves into smash. Blade combos, on the other hand, are a progressive flow that feeds into one large attack at the end. Starting at tier 1, the combo can only progress to the next stage if the next level of tier is used. So, for example, to progress to a stage 2 blade combo, you will need to use at least a tier 2 blade art or above, and the same holds true for the final stage 3. If you follow the charts given on the top right hand side, a successful completion of a blade combo will yield an elemental orb, and these orbs become the basis for massive damage. The chain attacks once again return, and once the gauge is full, you enter a chain burst state. The aim is to build up as many elemental orbs beforehand so that you can burst them and achieve a full burst, which will near on end the fight outright if you are able to meet the criteria. As a result, the battle system became extremely satisfying, managing the build up, planning the bursts, and then watching it all pay off in one fell swoop. Every element within the battle is important to get the most out of its system. And then there's all the extra customization on top of this, like driver accessories, blade auxiliary cores, blade classes that in combination contribute to a driver class and food buffs. It is a ludicrously deep and fulfilling system, one of the best I've ever played with. And it's a shame it takes a while to get going, as it's clear that the combat in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 divides opinion quite a bit, if only the pacing was addressed in some way. Thankfully, Takahashi and Monolith Soft had one last hurrah to address the issue, as they revisited a plot point that was shelved during the main game's development. Enter Torna the Golden Country. Torna itself was similar to Future Connected, but instead acted as a prequel to the events of Xenoblade Chronicles 2, taking place 500 years in the past. It was originally conceived as a part of the main game, but was later shelved for budget purposes. Takahashi would later reveal that, After looking at a variety of factors, we could tell that including Torna the Golden Country in the main game would divert a major portion of the budget and development time we had allotted for Xenoblade Chronicles 2. We hadn't shown anyone the prototype yet, and quickly decided against including this content, instead opting to take what we needed for the main game, which became the finished Xenoblade Chronicles 2. For quite some time after that, Torna the Golden Country slept on my computer's hard drive, but when we decided to include a new scenario with the expansion past, I knew that we had to revive Torn the Golden Country and tell that story. And it was clear that Takahashi felt that Torna was integral in fully appreciating Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Though shorter in length, Torna is referenced in many cases during the main game, which in of itself provides a strong foundation for a story of its own. Torna, at least narratively speaking, can be described as a more character-focused narrative, allowing players to relate to and understand the motives of those who later appear in the main game. And it certainly does that very well, adding more depth to some characters who may have been lacking slightly the first time around. However, the real redemption for Torna in particular was that it could address the issues from the first game. We heard some feedback that the systems in general and the battle systems specifically were a bit hard to pick up, or intimidating, so we did want to give new players who might feel that way a game that had systems that were easier to pick up for the first time. The shortcomings of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 were addressed as promised. Members were now able to be switched on the fly, and the user interface was streamlined. Tutorials could now be revisited, and camping acts as a multifunctional medium for crafting and leveling up, along with a repository for minor heart-to-hearts. However, the biggest change came in the combat, with characters now split into teams. These teams would function as both a vanguard and rearguard that could be switched within combat. The rearguard themselves now act independently, with unique arts specific to the role they find themselves in. Blade combos have returned, but this time made the elemental orb build up faster. Instead of the need to finish a blade combo, an orb would be afflicted as soon as a blade art is used, meaning that even though the combat may not feel as satisfying as it was in the slower yet meaningful approach of the main game, it serves the purpose of not only making the combat faster at the start, but also makes it more accessible to those who struggled initially, which arguably was required in this shorter game. Torna does what it sets out to do, functioning as a strong addition to the base game. There are some excellent story beats within it, a deeper dive into some already established characters, and most importantly, at least in Monolith Soft and Takahashi's eyes, it allows them to finally complete what they set out to do initially.
It's no exaggeration to state that in the present age, Xenoblade Chronicles as a series is one of the highlights of the modern JRPG era, displaying a grandeur and sense of wanderlust that many games can only hope to achieve. The central themes of the games are mature and multi-layered, supported further by their relatable cast members and presentation, a realisation of an ambition that Takahashi had when he first started development. The journey of this series from pen and paper to its eventual fruition as physical games in the hands of many feels like a redemption of sorts for Takahashi, who for so long would find his ambition overreaching the means at his disposal, whether that be through Xenogears or the cut short Xena Saga. If anything, these experiences acted as a learning experience for Takahashi himself, lessons that he incorporated into his future ventures. Ambition is a notable characteristic, but is only at its most powerful when tempered within reality. Over a decade and a half later from that first model, that he created along with fellow founder Hon, Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is right around the corner. And with that, it would be a fair deduction to state that maybe, just maybe, his vision has finally been realised.